This is perhaps the video for which architecture fans have been waiting. Frank Lloyd Wright is the world's most famous architect, and Falling Water is his most famous building. If you ask the average person, and by the way, if you've been watching Architecture Codex videos, you're way above average, but if you ask the average person to name two architects, they will probably be able to name Frank Lloyd Wright, and most will not be able to name a second architect. But if they do, it's probably I.M. Pei if they're collecting Social Security, and it's probably Frank Gehry if they're not collecting Social Security. I've asked people, so I know this. He is the king. Frank Lloyd Wright is the Elvis Presley of architecture. Frank Lloyd Wright's body of work is just too immense, too varied, and too impactful to be fully addressed in one short video, so I'm not going to even try. But I will try to dispel at least one myth about Frank Lloyd Wright. He did not invent modern architecture. He actually started working as part of the arts and crafts movement and then evolved into a premier modern architect. Frank Lloyd Wright projects date back to the 1880s, and some of these homes often had carriage houses for the horses and rigs instead of garages. But like what Elvis Presley did for rock and roll, Wright made modern architecture popular for the masses. Louis Sullivan is credited with being the first modern architect, and that makes Louis Sullivan the Chuck Berry of architecture. Modernist architectural philosophy, often called rationalist architecture, tried to reduce the building to a few truthful elements, eschewing decoration and history. And yet, Frank Lloyd Wright's early modernist buildings, such as Unity Temple, still had a bit of decoration on them. It took a while before European architects, such as Mies van der Rohe, inspired by Frank Lloyd Wright's buildings, took modernism even further, to the point of the simple point-line plane of Mises' Barcelona Pavilion. By the 1930s, a lot of people thought Frank Lloyd Wright was past his prime. Some even thought he was already dead. He had suffered through a lot of ups and downs, professionally, personally, financially, and there were a few scandals. But he still had his devotees, including someone working for him, Edgar Kaufman Jr., whose parents owned Pittsburgh's premier department store. The family owned some woods southeast of Pittsburgh, and they engaged Frank Lloyd Wright to build them a little cabin in those woods. Long story short, the result was falling water. The family tells the story of standing on a promontory with Frank Lloyd Wright, overlooking the Bear Run tributary, what some people call the Mill Run Creek, and pointing to a waterfall and saying, that's what we want to see from our house. This is where the power and vision of Frank Lloyd Wright shows. Most other architects would have simply said, okay. But Frank Lloyd Wright said, no. What you want is to be part of the waterfall. And the family said, yes. That promontory is where most people stand today to admire the house designed by Frank Lloyd Wright. What often sets Frank Lloyd Wright's buildings apart from other architects of the time was that his buildings drew inspiration from the landscape, as opposed to the traditional neoclassical approach, which was to change the landscape. For the neo-revivalists, it often meant flattening the hills and making the land symmetrical. But Frank contrasted that approach by saying things like, the house should not be on the hill, but be of the hill. At Falling Water, the house he designed is of the waterfall, and that has been its glory. Much has been written about the acrimonious building process and the budget overruns. It is true that in exploring new ways to do things, you run across new problems, and Wright did not have all the answers. He relied on others' expertise to make things happen at times, and the building had some inherent flaws that required a major restoration in 2002. But those who fall in love with a Frank Lloyd Wright building and become part of his cult say that paying to maintain a Frank Lloyd Wright building is worth it. If you want the usual tour guide pablum about what happened when and what this does and what that means, you can get that from a lot of sources. I want to focus on something else. I want to focus on the why the building is so universally appealing. Why, when people see it, their immediate reaction is delight and awe. 
One of the reasons so many of Wright's homes are attractive is the organic materials he uses, wood and stone, mixed with manufactured materials such as steel, glass, and concrete. In that way, they are not unlike the revivalist Victorian Tudor homes around the turn of the 20th century. While modernists from Le Corbusier to Richard Meyer pursued non-materiality as a goal, Frank let natural materials speak in nearly all his works. Natural materials such as wood and stone are elemental materials and unite us subconsciously with the earth. At Falling Water, all the horizontal planes, the roofs and the cantilever terraces have the same ruddy buff-colored concrete texture, a natural take on a manufactured product. All the vertical piers use natural, flat, stacked, coarse stone, giving an organic structural spine that holds up the house and anchors it to the earth at the same time. And their rustic, variegated colors mimic the stone in the creek bed. Also mimicking the slabs in the stream are the large rock ledges that were not moved or chopped, but rather became part of the living room floor. Between the majestic stone piers are voids, dark and cave-like, hearkening back to primordial shelter. These voids can be either open exterior spaces or encased in thin red steel and glass for interior spaces. His use of stone in near organic form keeps the aesthetic inspiration close to nature, which is the same source of the aesthetic of Greco-Roman architecture, which also looked toward nature for inspiration, albeit in a way that was more refined and idealized. And like Gothic architecture, the building has frozen structural expression. Those cantilevers, while firmly anchored in the stone walls, hover, imposing themselves into the air, defying gravity that reminds us of flying buttresses. There is both balance and dynamic movement made still in the composition, almost like a calder mobile waiting for the wind to set it in motion. The building embraces motion by being a channel for the constant kinetic movement of water flowing and falling below it. There is almost a feng shui balance to it all where the materials and their natural forces are creating harmony. It's almost as if nature is saying, I wish I could design like Frank Lloyd Wright. I know Frank Lloyd Wright studied Asian architecture, but I cannot say if any feng shui influence was overtly part of this project. Shortly after, Frank Lloyd Wright and Falling Water appeared on the cover of Time magazine, and his career was revived and his place in the world as the most famous architect was established. I think the greatness of the work justifies the claim, and Frank would go on to practice for another 20 years, still thriving, still changing, and concluding with the Guggenheim Museum in New York City, completed just after his death in 1959. Ladies and gentlemen, Frank Lloyd Wright has left the building. I'm Michael Molinelli, and this is Architecture Codex.